Project Tribute Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to aiding our nation's first responders. Our vision and mission is to enhance the life saving capabilities of our first responders and raising awareness and funding for the life saving work that they do. Our goal with the podcast is to be an educational avenue and a method for our heroes to express themselves. In the podcast, we will discuss various tough subjects. Some of the subjects may be uncomfortable or controversial. Our guests have a right to share their thoughts and ideas and for our listeners to hear the unedited words of our guests. The Foundation's role is to showcase a diverse array of thoughts and opinions within the first responder community. If you hear something that you do not agree with, please consider reaching out to us at projecttributefoundation at gmail.com and join our podcast. If you're a first responder and you would like to share your story, we truly would love to hear from you and learn from your experiences. Please enjoy this week's show, and as always, like, comment, and share to help us grow. You can find more information at www.projecttribute.com. Thanks, and have a great one. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Project Tribute Podcast again. I am your host, James Walker, and we have another special guest today. Jacob. Jacob. All right. So, uh, Jacob, could you just tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and how you got there? Yeah. Uh, my name's Jacob, obviously. I, uh, I'm a volunteer firefighter, a full-time paramedic. I uh, started in the fire service, first responder uh, service, actually, public safety, about, it was right about 10 years ago, 2013. Mm -hmm. I did a little bit prior to that and got out for a year or so to get my ducks in a row and then come back pretty strong. Uh, So whenever I started in 2013, it's actually August of 2013, so I'm coming up on 10 years. Um, I started as a volunteer firefighter started getting some classes under my belt you know um, because i knew i wanted to do something full time yeah for Uh, sure started and went and got an emr which is emergency medical responder it's about the lowest of the um medical responder class you could be yeah so john just real quick john had mentioned that um back on our last episode it's nice that we're doing um two guys in the similar field back to back. Um, if you haven't seen the John Wayne podcast, make sure you tune into that. That's going to be um, posting and will be up um, throughout the next few weeks. Um, but he was telling me about the steps for the different like levels, right? Or medical uh, paramedic type stuff. Um, I had no idea that it was like that. So you went and got, cause he was saying there was some interplay that could happen as well. Right. Right. So, You know, you start out as an EMR, Mm -hmm. uh, then you go EMT, then you have your advanced EMT, and then Mm -hmm. you have paramedic. So all four different levels, uh, which that means you could do different cares for your patients. Mm -hmm. Right now, I went through EMR and then EMT, and then I have my paramedic. I've been a paramedic, I'd say, about two years. I'm coming up on two years now. So that's the advanced life service. Uh, Yeah. We can do a lot more in the ambulance, you know, for the patients and the care. What, um... What what was the time? Were you working throughout all of those? Yeah, or? absolutely. Um, so I was young, obviously, back in 2013. Uh, I was full time job. I also had a little little girl, little daughter. Um, she was probably about two years old whenever I started all this, and now she's 11. Oh, awesome! Yeah, yep. And I also have a youngest daughter now. She's about a year and eight months. But I'm still training as we go. I mean. You you never stop training, so no, you never do. <laughs> yeah, you know how it is. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh. Anyways, paramedic now, but throughout all the classes, we had full time jobs. You know, yeah. just like John, I've seen some of his podcasts. He's full time job. He works two or three jobs and still volunteer uh-huh. firefighter. So yeah. I mean, literally. Now you were saying that you volunteer as well, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I'm actually on the same department as John, so we work well together. How long have you been doing that? volunteer since 2011 uh, two different departments but 2011 does it not get like overwhelming doing all those different things or 
Absolutely. I mean, it, it does get overwhelming. It takes up a lot of your time. Uh, but you have, as you know, you can have, I mean, if you have that dedication and commitment, you know, to your community, to surrounding mm -hmm. communities, it, it's not an issue. Yeah. So. It, it feels good to do that kind of stuff because you feel like you're providing a service that needs to be provided. Absolutely. Um, and I mean, what, what better way to spend your time than helping people? I agree. So what uh what kind of got you into the mindset of wanting to do something like this uh you know in high school i, I knew i wanted to do some type of public safety uh -huh. um you know whether it be military um a first responder background law enforcement firefighter yeah. and ems yeah um so i knew i wanted to do something to help out you know it's something i've i've always been good at and i love mm -hmm. i mean I, I really honestly couldn't see myself doing anything else for one, I mean, pretty much all I know at this point. I mean, I'm 31 years old, been doing it for quite a while. Have you ever uh, thought about making a career change or is this just, this is it pretty much? You know, at times I have thought about career changes, but what, you know, everybody looks back at the money, you know? Like, oh, yeah. Hey, like, hey, you know, I'm, I love my uh, job, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like I don't get paid enough or, you know, something along those lines, but yeah. You got to love what you do. They say if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. Yeah. And honestly, I look forward to going to work every week on the ambulance. Yeah, it's a true statement. Um, yeah, that's that's where I am at multiple times uh, every month. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that Absolutely. Of, especially having a family, too. Yeah. It, it makes, makes it, it hard, you know, because it's like, man, I really love what I do. but. Yeah. I just need more money, you right. know. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, we gotta we gotta survive. Absolutely. Know? It's like you know, I've I've heard or see on Facebook, YouTube, things like that, different podcasts that there's so many first responders living paycheck to paycheck. It's a vet. I mean, unless I it, here's the thing, you know. I mean, unless you're you work for a very large agency. You're probably not going to be making a whole lot of money. Absolutely. Um, and I mean, even sometimes those larger agencies, they may be paid pretty well, but the workload that they're yeah. having to take on because they serve a larger metropolitan area, mm -hmm. like population size, still doesn't compensate them fairly for the work that they're doing. Right. So, I mean, it's tough and it's a problem that's all around, you know. Yeah. Uh, I work part time security whenever i can <laughs> right you know yeah. to try and make extra money i think you you mentioned uh in our conversations prior that you have some kind of uh side gig going on or something like that right to try and make more money yeah uh during the spring and summertime i like to mow some grass you know extra money so uh kind of keep that money coming in throughout the summer i mean and i work a bunch of overtime at the ambulance if i can do you have like a um I like to give you a little plug. Do you have like a Facebook um, page or anything like that? Are you going to be making one for your little uh, mowing business? Yeah, it's actually uh, MJC Lawn Care. MJC Lawn Care. That's right. Is that on Facebook? Yeah, should okay. be. It's directed to. I mean, right off my personal page. Okay, I got you. So somebody can look that up in the Facebook and go to your page yep. and give you a like and a follow. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, awesome. And while you're doing that, make sure that you give Project Tribute foundation a like and follow as well to everybody out there listening but yeah you know it, it it's tough man uh because when you have a family too you know you have people that depend on you and you know you have to get the bills paid you have to make sure that food's on the table you have to make sure that you're paying off debt you right know? yeah absolutely. and it can be tough because Heck, sometimes you can even have your family being like, hey, you know, maybe we need to make some kind of change here. So you have to, yeah. you're like, well, I really like what I do. I don't right. want to go make more money and do a job that I don't like. Yeah. Right. So I mean, you really can't find a job like being a first responder. No. I mean, it has everything. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Absolutely. What um, do you plan on kind of staying in this branch of first responders that you are in currently or are you wanting to kind of delve into 
I know some paramedics, EMTs, guys like that, eventually go into like the full on medical field where they go to be a nurse or right. know, something of that nature. You know, I've thought about it, and what makes me think about doing something like that, venturing off into something else, is again the money. I mean, yeah. whether I go to nursing school uh, to become an RN yeah. or a full time firefighter, like you said, for a bigger city. Yeah. Yeah, we're taking on more workload, but I mean, it's going to be worth it in the long run. Uh, Full time fire departments in the state of Oklahoma have a pension. Yeah. So, I mean, the same as law enforcement. Yeah, absolutely. You know, now, at the age we're at, we got to start looking for retirement. You have to. I mean, and with the pension, is it, does it follow the same 20 year rule as the yep. police pension does? Okay. Then, yeah, it's a pretty good, should be a pretty good pension then. Yeah. Um, do you not have a, is some kind of retirement system where you currently work? Uh, as as far as um the Crazy. ambulance service, yeah, we okay. have retirement, you know, okay. and we can add money to that. Gotcha. Okay, uh, so it's more like just a regular retirement that you get at pretty a, much like kind of a corporate job type yeah. thing. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Um, so what kind of, have you ever thought about moving to, um, like going to a larger ambulance service like what kind of th what do you like about working for um an agency the size of the agency that you're at right now uh you know i like it as you know we're a mid-sized town I yeah mean, i'd say yeah. about not 30, too small yeah. not too big 35 yeah. 45 thousand yeah. something like that yeah and so we cover a big area i mean we get a variety of calls you know i like getting more experience mm -hmm. you know i like running certain calls to make me better i mean so i can be prepared for another one you know yeah. so i mean what would help me i mean if i decided to go to a bigger city on like the ambulance side or you know medical side mm -hmm. um would be that experience i mean getting there you know whether it be shootings you know stabbing whatever yeah i mean we get a variety of it here but yeah but not so much the the shooting stabbing stuff right. like that luckily yeah. Yeah. you know as far as you know for the for the citizens right. and stuff um I, th I think john in our previous conversation had mentioned that um so somewhere like imsa they you're in a you're in a special um agency to where you can actually like sleep at your facility right and stuff right so you're kind of you, it's similar to a firefighter right. schedule right yeah pretty much and how, how does that work for people that don't really know what that is? Uh, so there's our station. We work two 24-hour shifts in a week. So yes. you get that eight hours of overtime every week. Yeah. Some guys have it split up. Just automatically built in, right? Yeah, automatically built in. Some of our guys have it split up. I do two days back-to-back. -back. I do Wednesday and Thursdays, 48 hours straight. Mm -hmm. So I can be off, you know, for five days. Unless Man. I'm on another job. Yeah. So, I mean, that's nice. That's that, awesome. You that can, aspect of it is really nice. You can really do a whole other job. <laughs> yeah. Pretty Literally. much. I mean, get you another 40 hours and hey, yeah. you know. Shoot. Okay. Uh, but, huh. uh, so that's nice. And obviously, we get to sleep at the station while we're on shift. Yeah. Now, if we're busy throughout those 24, 48 hour shifts, whatever you're doing, I mean, no sleep, no rest yeah. for the wicked. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine you probably feel like a dog after a while. Uh, you know? Yeah. I come home on Friday nights, Friday evenings, and like I'm a just zombie. Like, yeah. You know, you're like, oh my yeah. God. <laughs> my fiance and kids are wanting to play, and I'm like, hey, I am trying to sleep. Yeah. Leave me alone. That I remember when I was on um, night shift as a cop, and oh my God, I don't know how. There's some people that are in relationships that are still on nights, and I just don't know how they do it. Yeah. I was Mr. Groucho, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. You know? I'm sure. I mean, it would be like I'd get off shift and I'd try to go to sleep. And the kids would be running around like mm -hmm. uh, freaking wildebeests. Right. Stomping on the floor. Yeah. And the spouse would be saying, hey, I want to do this. I want to yeah. do that. Can we go out and do something? I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I need some sleep. And I'm like yelling at people. It was horrible. <laughs> so. Yeah. It, you get to that point where you can even keep your eyes open. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I was happy to get off. Of yeah. Shift. Absolutely. I mean, but I see some, you know, the law enforcement guys down here that are on night shift for their whole career. I'm their like, how career. in the yeah. heck do you do that? Some, some, so what it is, is some people, man, some people just really like it. They yeah. just love nights. I mean, just the like the atmosphere a, of it. I mean, the atmosphere and there's a certain 
there's a certain type of calls that come out on night shift that people really like. Right. Um, there's not as many good citizens out and about. Right. So, I mean, usually if somebody's out, especially in a smaller town, if somebody's yeah. out driving around like 3 a.m., 4 a.m., you to know, no good. yeah, probably, you know, yeah. one could assume, right. Hey, what are you up to? Right. This is not normal behavior right. for you to be out. Do you work nights? Like what, what right. what's going on? You know, you're just out and about driving around at 4 a.m. in a small town. Something's probably up. Right. Right. So they can do a lot more investigative type stuff yeah. on night shift. Right. Like they're not pulling over the grandma that's going to shop at Walmart, right. you know, cause she made a traffic infraction, you know? Uh, and Hey, if she made a track, I'm on day shift. <laughs> like, yeah. Right. If a grandma made a traffic infraction, we're going to pull over, you know, it's just yeah. it's part of it. But my point is that they can target more, um, heavier crime like right. drugs duis things of that nature absolutely i mean especially at that time mm -hmm. some people like that yeah. i i kind of like being more out into the pub in the public's eye and stuff right. like that on which is why i like days so right. much so and plus it worked it works really well with the family so are you on like the i guess what are they called baker shift or yeah yeah um pretty much yeah, yeah. i mean that we don't really use that term uh -huh. anymore uh, but yeah, Baker shift yeah. pretty much. Uh, was it alpha? Uh, was it alpha? No, Adam, it was Adam Baker and Charlie Yeah, is what it was. Yeah. Adam was nights, Baker's days and Charlie shift is evening. Gotcha. Shift. Gotcha. Um, yeah. But night nights worked terribly. Um, mm -hmm. uh, evenings, evenings would be okay. But the problem is when, if your spouse works a regular like job, right? right nine to five type thing when she's home like or husband whatever when they come home you're still at work right because you're working 2 p.m yeah. to 10 p.m and you gotta worry about getting the kids out of school and stuff yeah everything pretty much all of the important stuff of the right. day if you're if you have a family to support is happening toward in that time zone that you're at work right so cooking dinner eating dinner cleaning up putting the kids to bed you know spending time with your significant other you know crap like that is all when people are not at work they're at home right so your your free time is when everybody's at school and work so mm. i don't know i mean day day shift's definitely the the easiest when you have a family yeah so. absolutely now if i if i was a single guy if i was a single guy i would probably really like um either nights or evenings yeah you know because it's it's more fun oh yeah there's absolutely. more stuff going on at absolutely. that at that time but i like the night shift on the yeah. ambulance i mean you know like i said we work 24 48 hours whatever it may be i like coming into the night shift because you know hey we could get something you know we got to do our job you know mm -hmm. it's like hey you get that call for cpr in progress or overdose and you're like let's get it you know let's yeah. do our job heck yeah we get catch a lot of falls around here elderly falling yeah, I see that pop up on the screen all the time. Yeah. <laughs> are, those, right. are those the lift assist ones? Yeah, pretty much. You just like lift them up. All right, here, okay, go back so to what, bed. What is, explain explain a lift assist call. Because so, I see it all the time. Yeah, I mean, it happens a lot. So you normally, I mean, if it's somebody that the ambulance can go out there and pick up, uh, fire doesn't first respond, Some, you know, if it's like a small mid-sized lady yeah, yeah. Or gentleman yeah we go out there help them get back up get get them to the bathroom or the bed wherever they need to be wherever they should be you know three o'clock in the morning we get called out for a lift assist it's like why aren't they in bed you know? <laughs> Yo, so you know, we're having to wake up go out there which it's our job you know yeah. it's no big deal yeah yeah but um <laughs> so that they're not injured on the lift assist it's like all right we're going back here put them where they need to be and then we we leave is you know, it they, is it usually at um like I, I, I get confused on like who call is it the person itself who calls like hey I fell like a right. life alert type situation right. pretty much I, I mean fallen and I can't get up yeah thing. a lot of times know. a lot of our patients or a lot of elder elderlies around here have their life alert and they just hit it now some can I've heard you guys talk about it before they're down on the floor for three or four days they fell oh yeah you know oh, yeah you know we run in situations like that all the time and at that point they're down on the floor then that ain't no lift assist no more. We gotta take them to the hospital. They're looking at dehydration, fecal matter, yeah. you know, urine all over them. That's yeah, it's a whole different situation. So 
stuff can their blood and stuff can kind of pool and oh, everything, yeah. right? Absolutely. With them being in a yeah. similar like the same position for yeah. that long. There's just no circulation. Yeah. You know, and we had one not too long ago, you know, lady been in the four for I think it was like five or six days. So in the same spot? Yeah, in the same spot. I mean God damn. and at that point family how how is family not checking on them, you know? Yeah, exactly. She didn't have a phone close by. Um somebody came over like that that next weekend and was like found her in the floor and they called us, you know. So Yeah, I was about to say how did how did I mean how did you even get the call? Who yeah. called? I mean family finally I mean they went over there yeah. a week later. They haven't heard from her. Well, like, man, it's know? been a few days. Yeah, it's been yeah, a few yeah. days. I haven't heard from grandma. So yeah. let's go check on her. Go there, like, check on her. And at that point we get there. It's not no lift assist. We know we have to transport this patient. We know yeah. you know and sometimes they're bigger patients. So we need fire department with us you know yeah i mean there's those type of lift assist it turns into a medical there's times i've been called out on a lift assist and it's a full cardiac arrest in progress like we got fire and please doing cpr yeah you know what um <laughs> now now that you mentioned that that always reminds me of the uh the one that you guys will get called to you know i'll be putt putting around and then i'll hear Hey, uh, medicals or fire and EMS are requesting an officer. They got a combative yeah. patient. Oh, that happens there. quite a bit. And it's like some, bless his heart, you know, it's some older guy that's confused and yeah. is throwing his crap, right. you know, like his literal like yeah. poop, yeah. you know, and it's like, holy crap, yeah. you know. So how, how often do you have things like that? I, I think a lot of people don't realize that sometimes you can get called to stuff and the person does not want to go. Yeah. So, I mean, like they clearly need medical help, but they do not want to go. That's, we come into situations where, you know, something like that, somebody's confused. We know they're confused. We ask, you know, certain questions like, Hey, do you know where you're at? What's your name, your birthday? Who's the president? You know, Things like that. Something, how many quarters are in a dollar? Yeah, how many quarters yeah. are in a dollar? If they can't answer those simple questions, we know they're altered. Yeah. I mean, we know their mind's not right. So then we tar start taking a look at, like, why are they altered? Or do they have a history of dementia? Yeah. Are they low on oxygen? I mean, do they have a urinary tract infection? Yeah. Are they on drugs? You know? It, I mean, altered, it doesn't have to be some elderly patient. It could be somebody young, you know, teenager, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it may be. Yeah. So if... They say they're elderly. We come into the play like where we get you guys involved, law enforcement involved. It's like, hey, this person's altered, but they're not wanting to go. They're wanting to fight us. So yeah. if family's around, we check and see if they have power of attorney, medical power of attorney. You know, yeah. it's like, hey, we need to take them to the hospital or can you transport them? Um, so we come that comes into play a lot for us, especially around here. Yeah, kind of, uh, it's like we need to make something happen. Yeah. This person clearly needs help. Yeah, we can't know? just leave them there. I mean, no, because it would it wouldn't. They end up fighting somebody, right. um, beating up a family member, yeah. or hurting themselves. And it you gotta, what we call a patient good. advocate. You know, we yeah. can't just let them leave them there and something bad really happen. You know, yeah. they die or fight yeah. something. Yeah, no way. Um, you know, we've we've had quite a few uh, overdoses here yeah. in our city. Um, and our county in general, I think that's kind of a thing that's happening all over the country right now. Um, but in, in your experience, what are some things that, um, some common drugs that you're seeing that are associated with overdoses and stuff? I kind of have my opinion on it. Right. Right. <laughs> you yeah. Know? But, uh, you know, for how small of a town we are, we have a lot of fentanyl here. Yeah. I, agree. I mean, as everybody uh, knows, exactly. it's everywhere. Uh huh. Yeah. It's it's cheap to get. Oh uh, yeah, we, it so, does a lot of damage too. It does. You know, I mean, we see a lot of that, a lot of fentanyl, a lot of meth here. Um, oh yeah, heroin. I've seen it a few times here. Yeah. So I mean, you know, surprisingly, I haven't encountered. Um, I think maybe I've encountered black tar heroin or something yeah. one time, but not not as much as I thought I would. Meth right. and fentanyl definitely are the the biggest things. And when it comes to overdosing like to where we're hitting somebody with narcan um it's usually fentanyl right what uh could you explain what narcan is for people that don't know what that is yeah so narcan is a opioid antagonist i mean so it's hitting the opioid receptors it's mm -hmm. blocking those receptors uh 
everybody's carrying it nowadays as far as law enforcement, fire EMS. Mm -hmm. I mean, even people walking down the road, they know, hey, I'm going to do some fentanyl later. I might overdose. So they're carrying yeah. it. It's carrying Narcan. So where, where are some places that people can get Narcan in case they, they have a, maybe have a family member that they think is using drugs or something like that and they want to be prepared for a potential overdose? You know, as far as like, I don't know if the health department's hand, handing it out at this time now. It would make sense if they did. Right. <laughs> I mean, this at, point, at this right. point, I mean, it's about it's getting to the point where we're dang near running out. You uh -huh. know, I mean, yep. not really, but we're using it all the time. Is there a place that people can buy it? Or I'm not for sure. I don't. I think you honestly, I've seen stuff on Facebook where you can like enter your information and they send you two deals of Narcan from the state of Oklahoma. Oh, okay. So well, but I, I don't really. I don't know. I just know it's on the ambulances for us. You know, we're ready yeah. to use it. But and so what it's doing is it's not. Um, I've always wondered this. It's not. It's not neutralizing the drug itself, right? right. It's. I mean, blocking. It's blocking the the, the, the fentanyl. Symptoms yeah, the symptoms right? of opioid. Okay. So when somebody does fentanyl or an mm -hmm. opioid, mm -hmm. it is the respiratory depression. I mean, they're stop. They stop breathing. That's yeah. the biggest one. They yeah. get it. And at some point, if they're they're down long enough, they're gonna go into cardiac arrest. Yeah. So we run into situations where they've been down quite a while, and we have you know certain services around that'll just keep on giving Narcan. Well, it's not gonna work. I mean, they got to be breathing, so you know, give them rescue breaths, thing like things like that along those lines. Because I mean, we've been I've seen patients that were given like twenty milligrams of Narcan and it didn't do no good. Yeah, exactly. You know, they got to be breathing. They get that circulation moving yeah. to get that Narcan working on the receptors. Yeah. You know, a lot of times we'll give Narcan, they come back to you know, or they're back to on yeah. our arrival. On, yeah, yeah, and they start fighting, throwing up, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. So we got to make sure the airway is clear. But if they're if they took enough fentanyl and we go and route to the hospital, they can overdose again because that that Narcan is not going to last. I mean, yeah, too long. Wear, the effect can wear off. Yeah. yeah. The fentanyl still in their system. So they can overdose again by the time we get to the hospital. So, I mean, if they're still in cardiac arrest or whatever on our, on our arrival on the scene, if their Narcan's not working. Yeah. And if uh, they haven't been down long enough, we'll do a cardiac arrest. We'll take advanced airway, you know, actions and. We, advanced airway actions, what do you mean? Yeah. So, so as a paramedic. Or something or. No, nah, I mean, we can as a paramedic if their airway's tough. Um, paramedics in the state of Oklahoma can intubate, yeah. put in an ET tube in the throat, and breathe for them. Oh, nice. Okay. We can start IVs. Yeah, heck yeah. Uh, give them drugs to start the ROSC process, we hope. And you can do all that stuff in the ambulance. Yep. yep. It's like a freaking uh, surgery room inside that ambulance, huh? Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, they say it's pretty much like a small emergency room on wheels. Are there, um, are there like different levels of ambulances or anything that we uh, have or... Is it all kind of the same base equipment? In Pretty the back much. Of each one? Okay. In, in our ambulances, we have, you know, we have BLS trucks, so they can't do too much. They do, like, transport from the hospital back to the nursing home mm -hmm. or whatever. That's that little, like, that little van thing, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they do that a lot, or we use that on, like, full transfers to um, St. John's. Oh, you know? okay. Yeah. But uh, our ambulances, you know, we have a paramedic and an EMT on every truck. Okay. So, except for, I mean, there's certain days that I'll have two EMTs. So, those two EMTs... Are normally not running 911 calls. They're usually taking a patient from the hospital back to the nursing home yeah. or from the hospital, you know, back to home or something like yeah. that. Yeah, gotcha. Hmm. Okay. Man, you know, people, it, it it's hard to really get um, a lot of this information, unfortunately. You know, I don't think that there is enough. Um, I mean, I don't even know how you implement it. Maybe doing more classes in high school or something like that on kind of what uh, what first responders do um, and what they go through on the job, what are the things that they see, what are the things that they deal with, um, what are the skills that they have, right. you know, just because I feel like sometimes people have a um, precon preconceived notion of like, oh, they don't do a whole lot or you know, their job's easy, you know, not everybody, yeah, right. But some people definitely have that kind of mindset. Um, so, I mean, just, I mean, just talking to you now and having talked to John on the last one, just on kind of what your, uh, what EMTs and paramedics go through and the, the skills and training you guys have to have. It's a lot. <laughs> I mean, it, it is. I mean, paramedic school is anywhere from 
my class was 18 months and you can take it to two years, get an associate's degree with it. I mean, we're going to school for quite a while. Yeah. I mean, we're, it's continuing education. Yep. You know, no matter what, you're always going to be learning. Mm -hmm. And like they say, the day you stop learning or the day you don't want to learn, it's probably the day you need to hang it up. Yep. Literally. Do you guys have like continued education that you have to do? Yep. Every two years from the time your license is, you know, you, by the time you get your license, every two years, you got to renew or get you those continuing education hours. How many hours do you have to have? Man. Uh, I know for us, it's, it's 25 hours plus two mental health hours of training every year. Yeah. Uh, I'm not exactly sure that many, I think it's like 60 something, 48 hours, excuse me, 48 hours for paramedics every two years. Now, it might be a little bit more now because the, the laws and the rules are changing every year, it seems like. so. What, um, is it just, like, classes you go through? or Yeah, I mean. Like, you can go to a class, like, into, in a city much. or something like that? Or? We have classes here. Like, some of our paramedics are instructors at our service. So, yeah. they teach a refresher class is what they call it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it has, it's pretty much going back everywhere, everything you learn and all the new stuff that's coming into play in the medical field. Yeah. Um, CPR, it changes every year. I sure mean, it does. <laughs> it, it, there's something always new being put in or taken out. I yeah. mean, so we, CPR is an every two year thing. Um, PALS, which is pediatric advanced life support. Is that the one where, um, uh, John was saying there was like a thing where you bring out a mat. And yeah, you, yeah, pretty much. That, yeah, it's a Brosslau okay. tape. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That that helps us a lot. I mean, if you have one of those, it comes in handy on our treatments for that patient, for that little that little kid. Yeah, I, man, I can't imagine. I can't imagine having a. Yeah, I mean, I, I take calls for like, um, for you know, involving children and right. stuff, and it's tough. I mean, but... you know, we don't run them a lot here, but when yeah. you do, with. It could be somebody you know. I mean, even oh, if it's yeah. not a little kid, I mean, a little baby, those are tough calls. I mean, I oh, ran a few and they, they suck. Yeah. But you got to be prepared because it's going to happen sometime in your in your career. It's going to happen. Yeah. Don't don't plan on it not happening. I, I did that and I ran a pediatric cardiac arrest. I mean, oh, goodness gracious. Yeah. So, I mean, those happen a lot. What are, uh, do you get a lot of choking calls, children choking on stuff? Yeah, we do. Actually had one last week. Really? Yeah. Little baby choked on a quarter. Oh, a quarter. Yeah, oh, a quarter. Yes. It, I, I would say it wasn't a little baby. It's three, four years old. What, um, do you have to do one of those, uh, bag suction things? No, uh, actually the baby had got it up by the time we got there. Dispatcher while we were in route said the baby is crying, which is good. We like to hear crying and screaming. We know airways, you know, air's being moved at that time. So yeah. it's not a full full on choking or shortness, you know, losing like a full breath. blockage. Yeah, full thing. blockage. Yeah. So that was good. I mean, but when we if that does happen, um we do Heimlich maneuver or back thrust, you know, depending on how big they are. I see uh I see ads all the time for that thing where it's like a, it's like a, it's like a, I don't, I, see, I, don't I know, know what you're talking about. You like <laughs> stick it to the face and you like suction it out. Or yeah. Something. And it like it yeah. shows it's sucked out. Like, it says it works good. I've never used one that, I mean, we always go back to the traditional way Yeah. that we know is going to work. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people out there. I don't, I've never seen that like work in real, real time. I've seen videos, but we know traditional will work nine times out of 10. I mean, if not, go to and the when hospital. When you say traditional, what are you talking about? I mean, back thrust. I mean, you don't have to ha pay for that. I mean, kids are going to choke. So if you don't have that, back yeah. thrust, you know, CPR, um, Heimlich maneuver, you know, we know those are going to work. I mean, it's, yeah. it's worked in the past. If it doesn't work at that time, we get them to the hospital. I mean, yeah. they can do surgery. I mean, you get them there quick enough. What, so you would recommend that parents that – are watching this definitely get some kind of knowledge absolutely basic knowledge on absolutely you know before i became a first responder i was like ah whatever you know nah, I don't need that. Yeah. yeah i mean but the shit does happen dude i mean kids are going to choke mm -hmm. i mean i have a year and seven eight month old little got little daughter i mean she's choked i mean and me being in the what i do it doesn't make me i mean any more better than anybody else i mean I freak out too, mm -hmm. especially if it's your own kid, but no CPR, you know, no, 
the Heimlich maneuver, know the back thrust. I mean, a couple years ago, my mom was choking and she was, she was not being able to breathe, not, not talking, not, you know, I couldn't hear anything coming from her mouth. So I just grabbed her and I put her in a Heimlich maneuver. And about that time, here comes a big old chunk of hamburger across the room. Oh my goodness. Yeah, dude, it was, it was crazy the way it worked. I mean, but easy. Yeah. It, I mean, like you said, the old school stuff works. Yeah, <laughs> you know? it, it, uh, it does. I mean, if it didn't, they wouldn't be doing it or they exactly. wouldn't have taught it. Exactly. Um, what, when you were in your paramedic schooling, what was um, something that was like extremely, to you thought it was extremely challenging or if, if that makes sense, like, is there a certain topic or subject that they taught or procedure that they went over that was like, man, I hope that never happens. Yeah. Or I have to ever do that. <laughs> man, you know, a lot of it, it's learning advanced life services. So we go over a cardiac and there a lot about, a, about the heart, you know, EKGs is, it's a hard one. I mean, we deal with lethal rhythms on a daily basis. I mean, whether it be your truck or somebody else's truck, whatever, somebody's going to have that sometime in their shift. Mm -hmm. So things like that, you know, we're dealing with the heart. We got to know how to restart the heart, you know, give medication, certain medications we give. Um, we can intubate people, like mm -hmm. I said, and deal with ventilator stuff. So, I mean, you know, it's going to happen. You just got to be prepared. Now, in today's world, um, don't they, I know, like me, I'm, I'm a novice when it comes to medical right. stuff, but it, can't you just like, basically they have um, EKG machines, I don't know if yeah. that's what they're called, but you like, they just do it for you almost, yeah. like you just strap them up. Yeah, and, you're probably, are you talking about like for CPR or are you talking about like for paddles, you know, like, like they used to paddle type yeah. stuff, yeah. So, I've heard from the old guys, you know, the the old burnout guys at the station they're like back in the day we used to have paddles to shock people back mm -hmm. in the rhythm yeah so now i mean we deal with we deal with that but they're not paddles i mean they're a defibrillator we have monitors forty five thousand dollar monitors that can tell us the rhythm i mean we we know the rhythm we interpret it you know and we'll we'll decide if we need to shock the patient like if they're in a lethal rhythm like vtac yeah uh svt VTAC, SVT, what's that? Yeah, so VTAC is ventric ventricular tachycardia. It's a really fast heart rate. You know, you're going to okay, have... so that's really fast. Yeah, really, really fast. Okay. Um, you're going to have, like, low blood pressure normally, I mean, with that. Okay. So we don't have... And you can have it with a pulse or without a pulse. I mean, either way, you're going to shock the person. Okay. I mean... And then SVT? Yep. SVT is um, supra ventricular tachycardia, another high, high fast heart rate. Um, so we can treat that on the ambulance before we even get to the emergency department. Really? We can treat it chemically. It's what they call asymptomatic or symptomatic. If they're asymptomatic, we're going to give them uh, medication at first for those uh, arrhythmias. And then if they're symptomatic, we're going to go with the defibrillating or cardioverting them. Interesting. Yep. So, Man. yeah, I mean, I those, those type of rhythms, I mean, you get in that situation and you're, you're, interpreting this you put on the 12 lead put on, put on four lead 12 lead your defeb pads yeah so we're sitting there i mean this person's either gonna they're gonna die right now like hey we need to get on this yeah and it's like you better know your shit oh yeah because sure. somebody's gonna die yeah if, if you don't yeah dude it's it's a life and death situation when it comes to you guys i mean in in that moment sometimes it sometimes it is with us but right. not all the time but man if you guys are getting called I mean, you got to think, too, you guys run code to everything. Yeah. Everything you go to, yeah. you know. So usually there's some <clears throat> there's some kind of sense of urgency in every call that you guys get. Yeah. Uh, I mean, even if it's like a somebody fell down or something like that, you know. Right. Don't know. It could be, it could turn into something like more I said, dangerous. Well, or like hell, I they said, could have been. Cardiac there. arrest. Exactly. I mean, or broken hip. I mean, we don't want to take our time getting to the elderly female with a broken hip i mean she's no. in extreme pain yeah. and if she broke her hip there's possibility she could have broke her you know her femur and everything like that could be mm. bleeding out inside we don't know that yeah exactly. we don't know until we get there and nine times out of ten if it's a closed fracture we don't know if she's bleeding out so we gotta get her to the hospital let yep. them ct it let them scan that and figure that out yeah absolutely so i mean we we take them to our nearest hospital or we'll go to tulsa the trauma center mm -hmm. we kind of decide on the scene what's going on what are um what are some things that you want the 
let me see how would that be worded properly what are some things that you as a paramedic would like the public to know that would either help them understand your job better or help you do your job better when interacting with the public you know we get it that's a got, lot isn't it <laughs> it is so i mean to help us help them okay i mean if we're looking at that aspect of it cpr i mean people need to take a cpr class through the american heart association go that route yeah okay people a lot of times you know nobody no cpr is being done on a cardiac arrest well to save that person we gotta have early cpr early chest compressions and early defibrillation i mean that is that's gonna save people's life i mean yeah. we've seen it a few weeks ago on the nfl game damar uh -huh. hamlin uh -huh. what saved that guy's life was early cpr and early defibrillation that saved that guy's life yeah um so that is a big big thing i always preach um now as far as like us being on scenes and them to help us there i mean as it's the same with you guys same with law enforcement and fire kind of stay clear of our yeah. our scene you know i mean stay away from the scene yeah the other day we worked a car wreck it was actually a cardiac cardiac arrest that turned into a vehicle accident down on the highway so was that the one with the fire was uh, that the one you're talking about no this was in the ditch and oh, the okay. water yeah but this one i mean this dude was uh he coded before the wreck happened is what it looked like to yeah, me. So he just like, probably, yeah. what it, did his foot get locked onto the gas? Pedal I'm thinking something? so. Yeah. I mean, it was a, is a, a weird deal. And luckily we were, we were only like a block or two away. Fire was right across the street eating at a, a restaurant. Oh, that's convenient. Yeah. I mean, so it worked <laughs> out. I mean, in the, and it worked out what to save that guy's life. It all happened like at the right time. Yeah. Now, in theory, I mean, the guy, he didn't live, but I think it was just because it might have been a little bit too long. I'm not for sure. Yeah. But, I mean, people were there looking at his video. I mean, 20, 30 people were videoing us Ooh, as this guy is yeah. dead inside this car, yeah. slumped over, you know. With the fish eyes. Yeah. So, like, rubbernecking and yeah, stuff. Dude, yeah, dude. I mean, they're just looking at us, and, like, I'm asking questions like, hey, I need to know how long he's been down. They got a, He's got his grandson in the back. He's a four-year-old oh, in the back of the no, vehicle. That's I mean, horrible. It, it was tough. So I called another truck. And I was like, hey, I need you guys. We we got another patient. You know, when they got on scene, it was like, we got another patient. He's not hurt, you know, but it, a lot of it's traumatic for that little oh, that little boy time. to see this. Big I mean, yeah. so that was the hardest part of that call for us. Um, You know, the car was filling up with water at this time. There was another car seat with in the car. With water? Yeah, what? he was in a ditch. And the ditch had water in it? Yeah, it, oh, it, it just got done raining. Oh, crap. so Goodness there's two car seats in the car. We had to fill, make sure there was no other kid. You know, it was an empty car seat. Yeah. So, I mean, we did, you know, ALS care for this guy and got him to the hospital and let them take over that. Yeah. You know, it was like a, it was very quick. It was like nine minutes total time for us. Man, dude, that is a, uh... see, that, that's great. Yeah. So stuff like that. Yeah. That... I mean. That's well, tough. Man. Well, I say early CPR. Yeah, I mean, this guy just wrecked. There was very minimal damage that I could see because the front end of the car was in the water. Mm -hmm. But early CPR, I mean, bystanders probably could have started CPR. I'm not sure. I mean, I understand. There comes a time, like, where you're like, could I get in trouble for doing this? Yeah. For, I mean. For sure. But you also think of, I mean. There's also, if you, if you don't know how to do so yeah. CPR, for example, if you know nothing about doing CPR you're not going to know whether it's the right time for exactly. CPR or not. Exactly. And even if it is the right time, you don't know how to do it. So you're, you're not going to do anything. Right. Right. So, I mean, those class, it's hard to argue that you don't know how to do mm -hmm. anything in the age of YouTube and stuff. Right. I mean, even yeah. if you don't want to, I almost want to say those classes are free, but yeah, I mean, certain people, um, they charge for them because you got to pay for the card. Yeah. So, I mean, but around this area, there's a lot. We have a lot of CPR instructors, American Heart Association instructors around this I mean, area. If you do have to pay, they're super inexpensive. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, get a hold of us. Get a hold of you, James. I mean, we can always hook people up. Yeah. I mean, the um, uh, I mean, even if even if you don't want to go to the class, at least go uh, 
you know, look up how to do CPR on YouTube yeah. or something. Yeah, pretty much their videos will pop right up. Oh, yeah, for sure. But, yeah, I, I, I always want to ask that question. Um, and I'm trying to get better at asking that question because I know everybody has something different that they would love the public to know or say, hey, this would really help us do our job better. And people don't people don't know that. Right. Right. Just going off of what I said, there's not um, like a class or something like that that kind of right. helps regular citizens, not only, you know, to get people interested in being first responders, but also to kind of say, hey, this is what they do. You know, right. these are the things to do and not do around them to help them better do their job. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's an important conversation that needs to happen. Um, I mean, was that, was that the direction you were wanting to take? Oh okay. yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean the, the whole, what, what we want to do, um, with this podcast is give the public kind of a, uh, an eye and earshot of what yeah. we do and kind of give them more information about how to help us do our jobs better and just kind of understanding what we do. Right. You know, yeah. I mean, day day. Well, on the law enforcement side, what do you, I mean, what do you guys look for? Um, well, basically the same question, yeah. but to law enforcement. Uh, so the thing that the public needs to know is, um, situations are ever evolving mm -hmm. and we train very hard to try and get into a mindset where okay we're in a stressful situation we don't want to get tunnel vision right uh, which tunnel vision is basically you're in a super stressful situation your heart rate th is through the roof your adrenaline's dumping your vision shrinks mm -hmm. and you only focus on this one little thing right right instead of hyper analyzing and uh or being aware of your surroundings and thinking critically right and calmly through uh the situation while being able to make quick decisions right we train for that but it's still hard to implement yeah when you're actually in a stressful situation absolutely um so when your fight or flight response kicks in um we want to have more than just those two options, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> but realistically, you want to have multiple options that you can go through so you can think clearly about mm -hmm. what you're doing. Um, so, you know, just keep that in mind that it is when you see a situation on video or on the news or something like that, just understand that that is uh, more than likely a tough situation yeah. that those particular officers were in. And, you know, it just try to understand that yeah. a little bit, you know. Uh, and then as far as uh, what the public can do to help us do our jobs better is uh, courtesy, politeness, and respect go a long way. If you're being asked to do certain things by a police officer, uh, like, you know, put your hands on this. So let's say a traffic stop, right? Right. Um, driver's license and insurance you know mm -hmm. get them going hands on the steering wheel uh windows rolled down uh get you park at a safe spot hazards are on if it's at night your overhead lights are on so the cop can clearly see in the vehicle right uh if he's asking you questions like uh you know um i or saying hey i pulled you over because you were speeding okay you know, there's no need to get into an argument right. about it. Even if you don't think that you were speeding, you can get into that argument in court. That's what right. court's for, right? You right. issued a citation. Take it to court. You know, if the if it, if the officer pulled you over for uh, a reason that wasn't valid or something like that, fight it in court. You know, right. if the officer was wrong. Arguing on the side of the road is not the place to right. argue about that. For one, stuff. it's not safe. No, it's not. You know, it's... You're arguing on the side of the road. Uh, there's cars flying by. You know, it's just not a safe situation. Right. And it, it opens you up to um, have more charges placed on you or citations mm -hmm. or whatever would have you in the situation. You know, because somebody will argue, well, that, that's what court's for. Mm -hmm. you know, if you disagree with it, take it. You accept the citation. It's not uh admitting guilt is just saying hey okay i'll, I'll take care of this right you know, and the way i'm going to take care of this is i'm going to take this to court mm. so uh just be polite and cordial when you're interacting with a police officer and if right. you feel like they've done you wrong in some way 
follow up with the proper uh, procedure. Right. You know, whether that's a complaint that's documented or a, you know, taking somebody to court, suing a department, mm -hmm. whatever, what have you. Right. You know, there, there's a, there's an avenue for that other than getting into an argument in that moment. Right. So, you know, my biggest thing is like, even on scenes for us, you know, you talk about the fight or flight, you talk about, you know, things like that, you know, your adrenaline dump, it, same things happen to us on certain calls. Yeah. I mean, like tunnel vision, yeah. is a real thing, man. We don't want to get a tunnel vision over somebody. Hey, they got a, a jacked up finger. It's completely broken. Yeah. But they're bleeding out from their femur, you know. Yeah, yeah. We don't, we can't just pay attention to the, the uh -huh. pinky. I mean, uh -huh. well, they're not going to die from that. No. You know, I'm worried about the blood loss. You know, we can't get that tunnel vision. Yeah. Another thing, respect goes a long way for me on calls. I mean, you're respectful to me. I'm respectful to you. Yeah. I mean, I know it may be the worst day of your life, but I'm here to help. Oh, I'm here to sure. make things worse. You know, you, you know, and man, that, especially when it comes to you, you guys and fire are unique. Because truly, if you're on scene, you're there to help people. Right. But sometimes we come on scene and it's to make somebody's day worse, unfortunately. Right. right. But that's just part of it. You know, well, I mean, we use you guys. Our our first priority, our very first priority is scene safety. Yeah. I mean, we get there. If somebody's like coming out with a gun chasing us, he's just like, hey, we need backup. We need PD here now. Yeah. We try to get out of there. Yeah. I mean, so I ran this situation where we've had to fight patients until PD gets there. I mean. It's not because we want to, hey, we want to fight you today. Yeah. That, you know, that's not, I don't like that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know, so that's where you guys come into play. So respect me, I'll respect you. Now, if you have alter mental status, I'm going to take into consideration. Yeah, you got, yeah, put certain gloves on yeah. for that, you know? Yeah, low blood sugar and you're fighting me. All right, man, let's, let's get you some sugar, you know? We, yeah. We'll make the situation better and we won't have to, mm -hmm. you know, go the fighting route. But they... In that time frame, they don't understand that. Same after a seizure, you get somebody that's post ictal or confused after the go. seizure. There's a lot of times we have patients that'll fight us. I mean, to the very end, mm -hmm. but we have what they call chemical restraints. We can take care of that. Yeah. So the, um, <laughs> you know, now that you mentioned the sugar thing, I remember we had a situation to where um, there was, this happened twice so far in my career um we had a guy that we thought was a dui definitely dui right yeah. driving in the wrong lane of traffic uh weaving through cars stuff mm. like that but he's driving like 35 miles an hour yeah all right not 60 70 not super fast but right. it's just all over the place we get him stopped finally go up there and it's some older guy and he's like you know, he's out yeah. of it, man. He's like lethargic, uh, right. you know, but we don't smell any alcohol. But from his breath, you can kind of smell that that sweet kind yeah. of smell. And we are, we immediately called EMS. Oh, yeah. like, oh, crap. I think his freaking sugar levels are crashing yeah. or something like that. Either low or high. I mean, no matter what, it can cause you to have an altered mental status. Yeah. So he got... Uh, what, what do you guys do with that? So basically the EMS came. Right. Hooked him up, pumped him full of something, and he was right. literally fine. Was that around here in this area? Yes. Okay. So certain places have certain protocols. I mean, normally it's going to be the same. I mean, for something, a situation like that. So we'll get on scene. I mean, if you smell that ketone smell, that sweet, fruity uh -huh. smell, uh -huh. usually the sugar's going to be high a lot of times. I mean, it could be over five, 600. Normal is like 80 to 110. Oh, my goodness there. gracious. Yeah, so I mean, it's really high. So he's probably going in DKA or something at that point. Yeah. Um, but if they're low, uh, we get them out. We check their sugar, you know, things like that. If it's low and they're like not really responding, we'll give them sugar through an IV. Um, it's called D50 or D10. Okay. Uh, give them sugar that way and bring that sugar up. And then heck, in five ten minutes, they'll be talking to you like nothing. Like, what do you, what do you yeah. pull me over for? Why, Where why am, am I here? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what's going on? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> that's but, exactly you, what happens. It happens a lot. If their sugar's high, we don't give them sugar. Obviously, we'll treat it with fluids pre-hospital, yeah. and we'll take yeah. them to the hospital. Yeah. Um. A lot of times, some services, I think, I know we don't, but I think some services carry insulin to bring it down, start with that process. But we'll start. Oh, fluids okay. start kind of diluting it trying yeah. to yeah okay man that, that's a longer process you know and 
there, there's obviously a lot that goes into it. But, yeah. man, I think that was a great segment, great episode. Yeah. <laughs> Super fun. Uh, we're going to go ahead and be cutting it at this point. But I want to thank you all for listening uh, to the Project Tribute Podcast. I'm James, and we have our guest here. Jake. All right. Signing off. Thank you guys for listening again. Project Tribute Foundation. We are a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to aiding our first responders. Thank you for listening. For more information on our efforts, check us out at www.projecttribute.com. If you're a first responder that would like to share your story, contact us at projecttributefoundation at gmail.com. You can find us on various social media and podcast sites by searching the Project Tribute Foundation. 100% of donations are used to save lives while our retail store pays for any of our operational costs. Thank you again, and please be sure to like us, follow us, and share our foundation with your friends. Thank you, and have a great day.